everybody, I'm Jacob Krinkstead with Safety Pole Manufacturing and today I want to go over um, the Homer self-propelled harvester. So this isn't really behind the scenes of manufacturing but more so a product line that we are helping bring to the Red River Valley. We actually just got done with our harvest uh, a couple days ago. This thing just got a quick bath. Uh, we gotta go through the inside yet, clean it up. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about this machine and specifically why I think it's the future of sugar beet harvest, um, especially for the Red River Valley. Um, we have a really large co-op here that grows sugar beets, but there's not too many self-propelled here. Then if you compare to Michigan, um, they've been self-propelled there for over a decade and there's well over a hundred of them. So um, kind of want to go through the basics of this machine, why I think it's the future and what this thing can really do for the growers in our area. The main reason why I think this is actually the future um, of sugar beet production would be its efficiency. Um, it's got a 12 row defoliator with a 12 row pickup head and a 32 ton cart all built into one chassis. So you're basically combining three items into one. I get a lot of arguments that it's basically a sugar beet combine and it kind of is but um, and more so their argument more specifically is that they can unhook a tractor and use it for tillage or use it for planting or some other functions on the farm whereas this is basically used for harvest and then it's, that's it and they are not wrong um, but we took this to six different farms this year as a demo lease program and three of them so 50 percent of them admitted that the tractor on their harvester is basically only used for that harvester so they're not using it for planting they're not using it. it's kind of a flex tractor so um, with that being said you know that drives the price of your your pull you know your, your harvest inputs quite a bit so um, for example this machine right here is about six hundred forty thousand um, dollars a couple years old it was converted to a right hand discharge um, you can go anywhere from a used eight row at three hundred fifty thousand dollars all the way to a brand new one over eight hundred thousand so um, obviously there's different levels there depending how in depth you want to go um, when you're talking about the conventional way we're doing things now but we start adding up a defoliator a tractor a harvester a tractor a cart a tractor um, that definitely adds up to only that I think the other biggest thing is help harvest help it is very hard to try and employ somebody for just 10 or 14 days I think another concern uh, that people think about when they think of this self-propelled machine is the amount of moving parts on it you know it's they're really taken back by how many hoses and sensors and stuff are on there but when you really break it down there's not that much to it yes is it is it more than your pull type yes it is but also it's way more technology than your pull type uh, one of the biggest features on this thing is that each share is independent so if you look at it you'll notice there are no lifter wheels um, they have what they call a share so it's on a centric shaft and it's got little walking shoes and they actually dig the beat up and then pull it onto a grab section grab roll section bring it to the middle to the throat chain and send it under so there actually is not rigid so if there's one row that is farther down say push from a sprayer track you can just adjust the share of the computer screen and it'll go down and pick up that row so you're not dropping the whole entire harvester down for uh, one row uh, one thing we really noticed when we were here in the Red River Valley we had a lot of people say that you know for a 12 row machine you're gonna have to dig at five miles an hour to keep up because that's what I do with my pull type and we found that actually not to be correct um, we can actually speed this thing or slow this thing down to about 2.8 miles an hour and still keep our rhythm just because this harvester never stops um, if you can there's no point in running four or five miles an hour which you can do and then stopping and waiting unless you know it's muddy and you want to get out and clean or gain time that way but um, if you actually just slow the machine down do a better job cleaning and find your rhythm you can actually dig more beats with this machine at slower speeds than a pull type just because of that fact that you never stop another awesome thing about the hopper on this machine is that you can do openings or cuts very simply um, you can go all the way down and fill your hopper. You're not having trucks pull out and run over your beats and wreck them as you're trying to open fields. Um, so this thing makes opening an absolute breeze. Another thing you might have noticed from all the videos is that it has what we call crab steer. So once you get into a row, hit your auto steer and it starts running, um, the back end will actually walk over um, for two reasons. One, it gets the boom out farther so you're not worried about getting so close to your header. And number two, um, compaction issues. This year is obviously dry but you don't want all through six of your tires or three of your tires, I should say, in one path making ruts in your field. So this thing will actually spread it out pretty evenly. Now that sugar beet harvest is done here in the Red River Valley, myself and a couple of our team members are headed to Michigan because they're just starting harvest there. Um, we'll go there, you know, get some more hours on the machine and then you know, help out with service calls and whatnot and 
try and get some better training and knowledge so we can bring that back here to River Valley. Um, a, a major concern with some of our customers was, you know, not only does it look so complex, but what about parts? Where do I find parts? So that's something we've been big on with our other product lines, the Strong Box, the Crop Shuttle. We always like to have parts on hand because downtime is huge. Um, nobody understands that more than us. You only get a small 10, 14 day window to harvest. And if you're down for three of them because you're waiting for air freight parts, that's not going to work. Um, you're obviously going to have some mad customers and major lost production. So um, when we're producing things in the shop, we don't like to be down for three days. We definitely don't want our customers to be down for three days. So that is something that we're learning here is what we need to have on hand, um, what could go wrong typically, and how to fix that. So we'll be out there training for the next couple days. Um, I'll get some more video too of running it when I was here in the River Valley this year. Um, it was a little hectic. There's a lot going on. We're in the middle of our harvest with our other product lines. So I didn't get very much video of actually inside the cab here running it. So when we go to Michigan next week, um, I'll get some good video of us running it. Mo here with Josh from Homer Americas in Ruth, Michigan. Uh, we wrapped up our harvest, so we came out here to do some more testing, training, um, training more so I should say, on the machine. Um, brought a crew out, kind of got more familiar with it, got some more hours on it. Um, and also wanted to do, sit down and do a video and get some questions answered. So um, the first question I always get is when somebody looks at the machine, they notice there's no lifter wheels on it. So um, can you describe, I guess, how this machine works or actually lifts the sugar beet out of the ground? Right, so uh, what we have is uh, row units or shear bodies they're called. And uh, basically it's two arms with digging shoes and the arms are connected on an eccentric shaft. So basically like a crankshaft. So the shoes are, moving back and forth and they're also lifting up and down in a rotary motion so it's pulling the beat straight up out of the ground and uh unlike lifter wheels it's not taking that pinch of dirt and turning it 90 degrees and putting it onto the rolls it's more pulling the beat straight up and then bringing it back onto the roll bed and then each row unit is individual so of your eight rows you can go through and adjust each individual row manually if you want or it'll do it automatically sure. for you so so i noticed there's a lot of easy lift stickers on here i think that's probably what you're describing there um, can you describe what easy lift is easy lift is uh a system that uses the scalper position uh so each scalper will take the the crown height or the average crown height of the row and then adjust the row unit behind it so on row number one if that's in a sprayer track let's say uh it's taking the crown average the beats are smaller, they're lower in the ground, it'll run that row unit down uh, to pick up those smaller beats. But uh, if you have a tall stand, it'll pick it up a little. So you're, you're not taking in as much dirt. You're not lowering the whole header to get one row. You're you're picking and choosing which row and it does it automatically for you. For you. So. And then you can also override it if you want to. to right, to yep. individual. yeah, you can always override and control it, so. So another question I get is, um, cost of ownership, I guess, um, maintenance. So what is kind of the wear parts on it and, you know, just roughly the acres, you know, for each unit? Uh, sure, so starting at the front, uh, standards are all steel flail topper. Uh, they have four pins on the drum and they use a forged, uh, basically like a T-knife. Uh, they're really tough. They're pretty resistant to rocks, uh, you know, or stones, which we have quite a bit here in Michigan. Uh, but on those you're looking at 5,000 to 9,000 and when you're looking at replacing all of them sure. you'll change a few here or there sure. but depending same it's like your lawnmower you run it in the dirt it's gonna wear out faster sure. so if you keep them up you know into the leaves and not running it too low uh, they last quite a long time uh, digging shoes uh, we have our uh, Durish airs uh, 1,500 to 2,000 acres uh, depending on you know depending on soil type, if it's really dry or you got a lot of stones and it chips the car by, they don't last as long, but uh, that's roughly shoes, uh, rolls, uh, depending how many acres you dig. If you keep up on the hard surface, uh, they last a long time, right. you know, 8,000 acres or whatever. I'm sure that's similar to pole types too. Right, yeah. Yep. And yeah. the belting, you know, the boom belt and stuff, it's kind yep. of pretty comparable. Yeah, the belting, we use a high profile drive on our belts, so they're, uh, they drive on the rubber, they don't drive sure. on the rod, so you're not wearing out the rods. Sure. You're basically, after season, say you dig 800 acres, you're looking at 
maybe flipping the drivers around, running them another year, and then you change sure. them. So right. as long as drivers are cheap compared to belts. Right. So we always like to keep good drives on everything. Turbantines uh, in the cleaning section. Um, number one takes the most abuse. So you'll be changing uh, the ones with the risers or the flights on it. Sure. Those you'll, you know, those will wear out first or break. So, I mean, same with those, you're 5,000 range. Another rumor I hear a lot is uh, this thing's a million dollar machine, a million dollar lifter. Um, with all the options, with all the 12 row, the right hand discharge, the combi defoliator, you know, the three stage defoliation, is that even possible to get to a million dollars? I'd love to sell you one for a million, <laughs> but no, you're you're not uh, you're not in the million dollar range. Um, it, new, you're up for all those items you mentioned. I think you're up in the eight nine hundred maybe, but that's uh, a decked out you know if they come standard left hand from uh germany uh so if you do mm -hmm. 12 row header and a left hand you're in the 750 range depending on you know import costs and everything at, at the time of order but another option that i hear of a lot too is um factory refurb you can get uh factory refurbished with a one-year warranty from germany uh on a used machine so all wear parts are 90 percent or better the older machines get the more affordable they get the more depreciation on them so you can get into you know if you're an 800 acre grower and you say you want an 822 header you know a narrower header there's you know less expense there uh you're in the 400 range or, or around there depending on what you want for hours and you know right. there's there's normally a we can find a machine to fit sure. your operation basically that's so. another thing i was going to mention too we've been quoting a lot of guys you know they're modular so the lifter is actually separate from the, the harvester so yeah you can get a four-year-old harvester with some hours on it but get all new you know all the, all the mm -hmm. magic's kind of up here so yeah the uh, the header runs in the dirt and has a lot of moving components so that's where a lot of money and a lot of wear is sure. so you can mix and match between the header and the machine. Sure. One concern a lot of our customers has is the capacity or the uh, quality of topping. Um, being it's not a triple drum like we have on the full types, um, can you kind of describe how this machine tops? Uh, sure, we have a few different topping options. Uh, standard is the four pin steel drum in the front. So that will take 90% of your leaves and you'll leave an inch or two inches of petiole on the beat. And then that's where the scalper comes, rides up and then cuts the top off. Uh, when you get in the wider rows and you get leafier material, you'll have more material to deal with. We get rid of the four pin and do eight pin. And then we do a mix of steel and rubber. Sure. It'd be similar probably to your pole type with, uh, with the clamp on sections. And then we also have a, a combi defoliator it's called, and it moves, there's brackets that move the topper forward. And then in between the topper, or I guess the scalper and the lifter, there's a gearbox. And basically it's got a set of flails on the front side and back side, and they come down on the top of the beat this way. So it's taking the leaves and sweeping them out away from the top of the beat. Those two options really work well for the wider rows for when you're out, you know, here in Michigan, we're mostly 20s, 22s, uh, some guys on 30s. So the 30 inch guys really like them because they have a lot more leaf material sure. to deal with. Clean up the sides a lot better, yeah. Yeah. So I noticed too, um, Another big feature on this that a lot of people don't talk about, probably should, is that you're actually pushing your lifter instead of pulling it behind you. So, you know, most of the pickup is done before. So like on a pull type, you got the tractor running over it, you know, possibility of knocking stuff out of the rows and stuff. So, so another question I get a lot is how do they do in the mud? Um, it seems like every farmer I talk to at trade shows, I'm sure you guys are the same way, has the worst ground ever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's gonna be kind of question on the muck in the, in the mud, so. When it comes into the header uh, with the easy lift system, for every half inch of depth they dig, is 30 ton of acre or 30 ton of dirt to the acre you have to sort through the machine. If you can regulate a half inch lighter across three or four or five rows, sure. not introducing that dirt in the first place. So you're getting just the beat, nothing else. Sure. So two rolls bring the beats out to the outside, and then the back three bring it into the center, back into the throat. So it creates a, a path or a flow on the on the roll bed. You're gaining cleaning because you're actually moving the beads out coming back instead of just pushing it all to the center sure. that helps with cleaning you know the 12 rows got a longer roll bed so you do more cleaning sure. with that from there you can adjust the cleaning in the turbines uh there's each one is hydraulically driven and you can adjust the speed and vary the speed of each turbine as it goes through its cleaning 
and then you can also adjust the gates hydraulically from the cab so the higher you raise the gates around the outside of the turbine the more material you can let out so normally you try and run them high as you can without losing beats out the side you know depending if it's early or late dig or whatever so, so how does you said that your turbines are variably adjusted um how does changing one to you know say one um, is running at 10 and two is at five how does that change um, how does that actually get cleaning then so basically what you'll do is you'll run uh, number one is where it comes from under the cab and then goes to the right so you're making those beats make a 90 degree turn so you'll run that one faster to get them moving uh, then generally you'll run two a little slower and then run three a little faster so they do more tumbling sure. you know the speed change is how you sure. can adjust the the cleaning and obviously the faster you spin the turbines the more aggressive it is I've so, noticed too like when we're filming or walking beside the machine that it's kind of amazing how all the beats kind of float up to the top when they're tumbling and all the leaves and dirt kind of go out the bottom and shoot out the side so yep. they work pretty darn good there and then from there they go into the ring elevator and then yep into the tank uh, yep. on this machine i noticed um compared to say other competitors um their boom is always at the rear of it this one's in the center is there an advantage to that yeah because uh the reason it's center remounted is the you can feed the boom from both sides sure. so we have a cross floor and then a front and a rear floor so the way our system works is it will run a little bit of beats to the front switch the auger direction and fill the back completely full and once it hits a door on the back gate it'll switch again to the front and finally fill the front uh, so the auger has got a one-way clutch on it so it will only run backwards and when the auger reverses that rear half of the auger stays put in the beats and you're not pushing the beats back all the way up to the front sure. so it it creates a big you know a pile on either side sure. of the ring elevator so you're so, not taking the rear ones and stuffing them under the ring elevator right okay. yep so i think that's all the questions i have um obviously if you guys have questions um leave comments below it kind of helps us you know realize what we missed and we can either answer there or maybe if it's a big enough topic do a whole entire video on that so with that being said thanks for watching